chapter 6. The Buddhist scriptures state that the first sermon of the Buddha consisted mainly of an explanation of the theory of interdependent originations, known also as the doctrine of the Twelve Causes. All the schools of philosophy which have developed in Buddhism, whether of realistic or idealistic tendencies, have adhered to this. The philosopher Kamalasila described this as the jewel of the Buddhist doctrine. The chain of interdependent originations is as follows. Okay, there's a chart here, sideways. The terms used in this enumeration lead themselves easily to the vicissitudes of individual lives, and this is usually the interpretation accepted by the Hinamayas Buddhists of the Southern School. For them, the series of 12 causes concern individuals, men or animals, but most especially human beings. I remember having provoked astonishment and formal denials from Sinhalese and Burmese Buddhist monks by hinting that the chain of interdependent originations could at least in its principal line apply to the evolution of a plant as well as to that of a man. In reality, although the, the well-read among them deny it, some of those who call themselves Buddhists, Mayanists of the northern countries, as well as Theravadins of the south, south have practically remained attached to the belief in a jiva, that is to say in an ego, an entity which transmigrates from life to life, forsaking its material body at the moment of death, as one throwaways worn out clothing to put on new clothes. This belief is howeverly, however formally and continually denied by the doctrine of the Buddha, of which doctrine the negation of the ego is the fundamental article and marks it off from orthodox Hindu doctrines. The Buddhist creed, as a matter of fact, consists of two short, incisive statements. All aggregates are impermanent. All things are devoid of self, parenthesis, ego or soul. This means that if we discard the component elements which form that which we call a man, a horse, a tree, a mountain, a star, or no matter what, if we abstract the qualities which make them perceptible to us, we discover nothing which is distinct from these constituent elements, from these qualities. We do not in any way find the man, the horse, the mountain in itself. These names apply only to a collection of elements. The classic example given in Buddhist texts is that of a wagon, which consists of a collection of wheels and their spokes, a pole and so forth, or the house, which consists of a frame made of beams or rafters, of a roof, and so forth. But the wagon in itself, the house in itself, where are they? In the same way, if from a man you take away the physical form, sensation, perception, mental activity, and consciousness, what remains? Where will you find the man existing in himself outside the corporality and mentality? In the secret teachings, great importance is attached to propounding this negation of the ego as a fundamental doctrine. Those who lag behind in the belief in an ego, it is said, do not understand the meaning of the teaching. They are in no way Buddhists. They cannot attain to liberation, to salvation, for without understanding of a transcendent insight of this absence of any ego, they will not perceive the means by which to go beyond being and non-being. None of those who profess Buddhism denies this creed and all repeat it in one language or another, but in most cases it is, quote, without having understood the meaning of the teaching, unquote. To the ego, which is denied by the Buddhist scriptures, some have substantiated, substituted a current of elements making their way as a group, as a bundle. Very much apparently like the quanta of a Western science. 
This current called Santiana, in a way, plays the part of individual life. The Thera something or other stated to me one day that nirvana consisted in the extinction of this current of activity when it ceased to be nourished by karmic contributions due to the activity of the individual. According to his opinion, that which we consider to be an individual is a particular current, a special santyana. Of course, the learned bhikkhu denied the existence of an ego existing apart from the santyana. The phenomenon which made up the current were discontinuous events following in obsession without being attached one to the another like a parade of ants. As for me, this current which seems to flow in isolation while preserving its identity among the numerous other currents seems to depend on an untenable theory. The Tibetan masters of the oral teachings will not admit it either. Those who interpret the chain of organ originations as relating to the life of individuals explain it in the two following ways or in some similar manner. And there's a chart. One, the best life, ignorance, samskara, mental activity, present life, knowledge, material, existence, mentality, organs of sense and the mind, impressions received by the senses, sensation, desire, grasping attachment, and actions. And the future life is birth and old age. And then there's another chart where it says past life, one, illusion, and two, samkara, which is karma. Present life, first moment of a new life conception. The five elements which constitute existence in the embryo before the formation of organs of sense. Formation of the organs. The organs in the consciousness begin to cooperate. Distinct sensations. Awakening, awakening of the sexual instinct, beginning of a new karma. Different pursuits in life. Life, that is to say, different kinds of conscious activity. And the future life is rebirth and new life, old age and death. That's just the chart. On the contrary, in the works of the Mayanist writers, we find interpretations of that ego which give a cosmic meaning to it, and at once a question occurs. Why are the 12 links of the chain of independent organizations understood differently in the sutras which mention them and in the philosophical works which explain them? Vasubandhu, dealing with this question, replies, because in the sutras, the chain of independent originations is set forth in a popular way for the use of the mass of hearers and in a way suitable for their degree of understanding, that is to say, as relating to individual life, while the works which give explanations of it are aimed at its deep meaning. Thus we see that Vasubandhu distinguishes between a wholly exoteric explanation and one for which goes more deeply into the subject. The Tibetans have their habitual classification of the outer doctrine, qi, and the inner doctrine, nang. They add to them the sangs and so forth, which they consider as a body of secret doctrine. Secret in the sense that only especially precipitates minds can attain them. The masters who expound the oral teachings of this category do not fail to advise their pupils to make themselves familiar with the inner interpretation of the chain of independent originations. The entire significance is stated in technical phraseology in the declaration. This existing, that arising, or again, there is no real production, only interdependence. An explanatory formula is expressed as follows. There is nothing which is produced by its own self, which is the cause of its own appearing. Nothing appears which is produced by another thing. 
Nothing came into existence by chance, but that which comes into being exists in dependence on causes. The theory of interdependent originations is closely bound up with that of the instantaneousness and impermanency of all phenomena, which consist, has been mentioned above, of discontinuous flashes of energy. The term interdependent indicates also that it is not a matter of a direct line. Care has been taken not to believe that this which exists engenders that which arises. It is not the time to do so, so to speak, because the flashes of energy are of too short a duration to permit a real act of production. Moreover, nothing is produced by one single cause. The combination of several causes is always necessary to bring about a result. The seed without the cooperation of earth, dampness, light, etc., will never become a tree. The fact that the theory of interdependent origination aims at bringing to light is simply that the temporary existence of certain phenomena is necessary in order to bring such and such another phenomenon into existence. None of the flashes of energy which constitute the world manifests itself without depending on the existence of other flashes of energy as ephemeral as itself and which take the place of causes for it on favorable occasions. In the Mayanistic interpretation of the chain of interdependent originations, this is broadened. Birth, decrepitude, death are no longer represented as the stages of life in the human individual who is born, develops, grows old, and dies to be reborn, recommence a similar course, going through the alternations of agreeable or painful sensations. It is a question of a universal law of impermanence in virtue of which everything which arises, being the result of combination of various elements, must necessarily disintegrate when causes other than those which produce the con constitution of the whole arise. The last words addressed by the dying Buddha to his disciples were, all that which is produced, composed, is perishable. The law of impermanence governs the suns to the depth of the fathomless space, just as it governs the life of the tiniest insect of the smallest grain of dust. It is not enough to understand that birth, decrepitude, and death happen according to such progression as our weak senses are capable of in registering. The process is continual in all beings, in all things, in the sun or in the grain of dust. Each atom which constitutes it individually lives the perpetual drama of birth, old age, and death. The cycle of interdependent or origins thus takes place in everything, everywhere, in the infinitely small as in the infinitely great. Its development does not take place progressively in time. The twelve causes listed are always present, coexistent, and interdependent. Their activity is interconnected, and they are only exist one with the other. In fact, the interdependent origins are in no way a description of incidents occurring to a being which would exist apart from them. Each being is the chain of interdependent origins, as this latter is the universe, and outside its activity neither being nor universe exists. The master who passes on the oral teachings to a pupil does not omit to explain clearly to him the theories which I had just summed up briefly and many others which have been elaborated by the subtle Buddhist philosophers of India and China, and by the Tibetan authors such as Gampopa, Yamyang, Shespa, various leaders of the sect of the Sakyapas, and so on. The master encourages his pupil to study the vast philosophical literatures available to him in the libraries of the great monasteries. He does not scorn learning, he is often himself a distinguished scholar, but the usefulness of learning, in his opinion, does not transcend that of a profitable mental gymnastic calculated to render flexible our intellectual faculties. 
calculated to bring about, about critical tendencies, suspicion, and doubt, this first step towards investigation and knowledge. The student is then put in touch with the elements of the sang why something or other, and the new interpretations of the chain of interdependent origins are suggested to him. From the statement of the first terms, ignorance, samskara, appeal is made to the attention of the pupil. What is it to be ignorant? Is it not to know? However, ignorance can never be total. One may, not, one may not know a certain thing, but at some time, one knows other things. In the final analysis, he who is aware that he does not know possesses by that very fact the knowledge of his existence, whatever may be its nature. Can we envision this incomprehensible ignorance, which begins the series of the twelve causes, as being erroneous knowledge, false views? Instead of imagining ignorance as a kind of vague occult power hidden in the depths of space and eternity, original source of the sorrowful pilgrimage of beings through samsara, <clears throat> can we not recognize that this, quote, not knowing is purely, quote, our own in the sense that it is an integral part of our being? What is it that produces ignorance? What is it that keeps it alive? It is our activity made up of physical acts and mental acts. Although based on a philosophical conception of the world, which is entirely different from that which inspired the author of the Bhagavad Gita, the oral Tibetan teachings agree with the Hindu poem in saying, nothing can remain, not even for a single moment, without acting. Everything is compelled to do so by the very nature of the elements of which it is composed. Parenthesis, by the nat natural functions of its being. What are the agents which urge us to action? They are the senses which produce perceptions, sensations, and we have seen in the preceding chapter that our senses give us incorrect information. They lead us into error. And if we are deceived by them, we are cultivating ignorance. For lack of access to reality, not only do we, quote, not know, but we erect on our wrong information various wrong views and the structure of a fantastic world. These mental constructions, based on the irrepressible activity of our mind and on ignorance, are the samskara, or compounds, the duchade, that is to say, the collections, the assemblages of the Tibet, that as the Tibetans name them. These collections are kept up by the faith which we have in their reality and by the use we make of them. It is thus that a kind of illusionary reality is given to the world, which we build up in holding it to be exterior to ourselves, whereas it emanates from us and dwells in us in dependence on the illusion of which we are the victims. It is in our own mind that the, quote, chain of inter interdependent originations, unquote, evolves, turning back on itself with these three factors, ignorance, dash desire, dash act, supporting one another. Instead of considering the something or other as a law which rules us, an exoteric opinion, or holding that we are ourselves this chain of origins flowing like a stream, we can make a further advance that the secret teachings only, in, with the secret teachings, only if we understand that if we are the chain, we are the same time its creator. Quote, I know you, O builder of the house, from now on you shall build no more. The pupil is left to meditate on this point, and the master goes on to examine another theory, but a long time may elapse in the interval. <clears throat>